The third mistake in moral mathematics is to ignore very small chances when they would either affect very many people or would be taken very many times. The fourth and fifth mistakes are to ignore very small and imperceptible effects on very large numbers of people. These are similar mistakes and can be criticized with the same arguments. But imperceptible effects raise one extra question. I need not state both mistakes. The fourth is the same as the fifth, except that very small replaces imperceptible. Many people believe the fifth mistake. If some act has effects on other people that are imperceptible, this act cannot be morally wrong because it has these effects. An act cannot be wrong because of its effects on other people if none of these people could ever notice any difference. Similarly, if some act would have imperceptible effects on other people, these effects cannot make this act what someone ought to do. One kind of imperceptible effect is not controversial. I may cause you serious harm in a way that is imperceptible. The dose of radiation that I give you may be the unknown cause of the cancer that kills you many years later. Though the cause may be unknown, the effect is here perceptible. But in the cases I shall be considering, the effects are imperceptible. Consider the bad old days. A thousand torturers have a thousand victims. At the start of each day, each of the victims is already feeling mild pain. Each of the torturers turns a switch a thousand times on some instrument. Each turning of a switch affects some victim's pain in a way that is imperceptible. But after each torturer has turned his switch a thousand times, he has inflicted severe pain on his victim. Suppose that you make the fifth mistake. You believe that an act cannot be wrong because of its effects on other people if these effects are imperceptible. You must then conclude that, in this case, no turning of a switch is wrong. None of these torturers ever act wrongly. This conclusion is absurd. So why are the torturers acting wrongly? One explanation appeals to the total effect of what each torturer does. Each turns a switch a thousand times. These acts, taken together, inflict severe pain on his victim. But consider next the harmless torturers. In the bad old days, each torturer inflicted severe pain on one victim. Things have now changed. Each of the thousand torturers presses a button, thereby turning the switch once on each of the thousand instruments. The victims suffer the same severe pain, but none of the torturers makes any victim's pain perceptibly worse. Can we appeal here to the total effect of what each torturer does? This depends in part on whether we reject A, believing that someone's pain can become imperceptibly worse. If we believe this, we can claim by pressing the button, each torturer causes each victim to suffer slightly more. The effect on each is slight, but since each torturer adds to the suffering of a thousand victims, he imposes on them a great total sum of suffering. Since the victims suffer just as much as they did in the bad old days, these torturers are acting just as wrongly as they used to do. In the bad old days, each torturer imposed on one victim a great sum of suffering. Each of the harmless torturers imposes on these thousand victims an equally great total sum of suffering. Suppose instead that we accept A, believing that pains cannot become imperceptibly worse. We must then admit that each of the harmless torturers causes no one to suffer more. We cannot appeal to the total effect of what each torturer does. On this view, none of the torturers harms anyone. Even if none of them harms anyone, the torturers, torturers are clearly acting wrongly. 
If we cannot appeal to the effects of what each torturer does, we must appeal to what the torturers together do. Even if none of them causes any pain, they together impose great suffering on a thousand victims. We can then claim C12 when 1. The outcome would be worse if people suffered more and 2. Each of the members of some group could act in a certain way and 3. They would cause other people to suffer if enough of them acted in this way and 4. They would cause these people to suffer most if they all acted in this way and 5. Each of them both knows these facts and believes that enough of them will act in this way, then six, each would be acting wrongly if he acted in this way. Someone may again object. In the case of the harmless torturers, four is not true. These torturers do not cause their victims to suffer most if they all turn each switch once. Suppose that one of them turned no switches none of the victims would notice any difference. Since a pain cannot become imperceptibly less bad, the victims would not suffer less if one of the torturers did not act. As I remarked, this objection raises the well-known Sorit's problem. If we accept A, our answer to this objection must involve a solution to this problem. Since this problem is both hard to solve and raises questions which have nothing to do with ethics. I shall not discuss it here. If we accept A, our objection to the harmless torturers must both be complicated and solve the Sorit's problem. If we reject A, our objection could be simple. We could claim that each of the torturers inflicts on the victims a great total sum of suffering. Of these two explanations, which is better? Even if we reject A, we may be wrong to give the simpler explanation. Whether this is so depends on the answer to another question. Consider the single torturer. One morning, only one of the torturers turns up for work. It happens to be true that, through natural causes, each of the victims is already suffering fairly severe pain. This pain is about as bad as it would be after the switches had been turned 500 times. Knowing this fact, the single torturer presses the button that turns the switch once on all of the machines. The effect is the same as in the days when all the torturers act. More precisely, the effect is just like that when each switch is turned for the 501st time. The single torturer knows that this is the effect. He knows that he is not making any victim's pain perceptibly worse, and he knows that he is not a member of a group who together do this. Is the single torturer acting wrongly? Suppose we believe that he is not. We cannot then appeal to the simpler objection in the case where all the torturers act. We cannot claim that each is acting wrongly because he is imposing on others a great total sum of suffering. If this is why each is acting wrongly, the single torturer must be acting wrongly. He acts in the same way and with the same effects. If we believe that the single torturer is not acting wrongly, we must give the other objection in the case where all the torturers act. We must claim that each is acting wrongly because he is a member of a group who together inflict great suffering on their victims. I believe that the single torturer is acting wrongly. How can it make a moral difference whether he produces bad effects jointly with other agents or with nature? I therefore prefer, in both cases, to appeal to the effects of single acts. Many people disagree. Even if we believe that there can be imperceptible harms and benefits, it may thus be better to appeal to what groups together do. This appeal is less controversial. In this section, I have asked whether there can be imperceptible harms and benefits. I am inclined to answer yes. If we answer no, we must abandon the claim that when applied to harms and benefits, at least as bad as and not worse than are transitive relations. I have also shown that it makes little difference which answer we accept.
On either answer, we must abandon what I call the first, the fifth mistake. We must abandon the view that an act cannot be either right or wrong because of its effects on other people if these effects are imperceptible. The fifth mistake in moral mathematics is the belief that imperceptible effects cannot be morally significant. This is a very serious mistake. When all the harmless torturers act, each is acting very wrongly. This is true even though each makes no one perceptibly worse off. The same could be true of us. We should cease to think that an act cannot be wrong because of its effects on other people if this act makes no one perceptibly worse off. Each of our acts may be very wrong because of its effects on other people even if none of these people could ever notice any of these effects. Our acts may together make these people very much worse off. The fourth mistake is equally serious. If we believe that trivial effects can be morally ignored, we may often make people very much worse off. Remember the fisherman's dilemma. Where there is overfishing or declining stocks, it can be better for each if he tries to catch more, and worse for each if all do. Consider how the fishermen cause a disaster. There are many fishermen who earn their living by fishing separately on some large lake. If each fisherman does not restrict his catch, he will catch within the next few seasons more fish, but he will thereby lower the total catch by a much larger number. Since there are many fishermen, if each does not restrict his catch, he will only trivial, trivially affect the number caught by each of the others. The fishermen believe that such trivial effects can be morally ignored. Because they believe this, even though they never do what they believe to be wrong, they do not restrict their catches. Each thereby increases his own catch, but causes a much greater lowering in the total catch. Because they all act in this way, the result is a disaster. After a few seasons, all catch very many fewer fish and they cannot feed themselves or their children. If these fishermen knew the facts, had sufficient altruism, and avoided the fourth mistake, they would escape this disaster. Each knows that if he does not restrict his catch, this will be somewhat better for himself, whatever others do. And each knows that if he acts in this way, the effects on each of the others will be trivial. But the fishermen should not believe that these trivial effects can be morally ignored. They should believe that acting in this way is wrong. As before, there are two ways in which we could explain why these acts are wrong. We could appeal to the total effect of each person's act. Each fisherman knows that if he does not restrict his catch, he will catch more fish, but he will reduce the total to catch by a much larger number. For the sake of a small gain to himself, he imposes on others a much greater total loss. We could claim that such acts are wrong. This claim does not assume that there can be imperceptible harms and benefits. It is therefore less controversial than the corresponding claim about what each of the harmless torturers does. Our alternative is to appeal to what these fishermen together do. Each fisherman knows that if he and all the others do not restrict their catches, they will together impose upon themselves a great total loss. Rational altruists would believe these acts to be wrong. They would avoid this disaster. It may be said, so would rational egoists. Each knows that if he does not restrict his catch, he is a member of a group who impose upon themselves a great loss. It is irrational to act in this way, even in self-interested terms. As I shall argue in the next chapter, this claim is not justified. Each knows that if he does not restrict his catch, this will be better for himself. This is so whatever others do. When someone does what he knows will be better for himself, it cannot be claimed that his act is irrational in self-interested terms. Remember next 
The Commuter's Dilemma. Suppose that we live in the suburbs of a large city. We can get to and return from work, either by car or by bus. Since there are no bus lanes, extra traffic slows buses just as much as it slows cars. We could therefore know the following to be true. When most of us are going by car, if any one of us goes by car rather than by bus, he will thereby save himself some time, but he will impose on others a much greater total loss of time. This effect could be much dispersed. Each might cause a hundred others to be delayed for 20 seconds or cause a thousand others to be delayed for two seconds. Most of us would regard such effects as so trivial that they can be morally ignored. We would then believe that in this commuter's dilemma, even a rational altruist can justifiably choose to go by car rather than by bus. But if most of us make this choice, we shall all be delayed for a long time every day. Rational altruists would avoid this result. As before, they could appeal either to the effects of what each person does or to the effects of what all together do. Each saves himself some time at the cost of imposing on others a much greater total loss of time. We could claim that it is wrong to act in this way, even though the effects on each of the others would be trivial or even imperceptible. We could instead claim that this act is wrong because those who act in this way together impose on everyone a great loss of time. If we accept either of these claims and have sufficient altruism, we would solve the commuter's dilemma, saving ourselves much time every day. Similar reasoning applies to countless other cases. For one more example, consider the devices that purify the gases that our cars emit. We would think it wrong to save ourselves the cost of repairing this device if in consequence we imposed great air pollution on some other single person. But many of us would not think this wrong if it merely trivially or imperceptibly increased the air pollution suffered by each of very many people. This would be the actual effect in many large cities. It might be much better for all of us if none of us caused such pollution. But to believe that we are acting wrongly, many of us need to change our view. We must cease to believe that an act cannot be wrong because of its effects on other people if these effects are either trivial or imperceptible. As conditions change, we may need to make some changes in the way we think about morality. I have been arguing for one such change. Common sense morality works best in small communities. When there are few of us, if we give to or impose on others great total benefits or harms, we must be affecting other people in significant ways that would be grounds either for gratitude or resentment. In small communities, it is a plausible claim that we cannot have harmed others if there is no one with an obvious complaint or ground for resenting what we have done. Until this century, most of mankind lived in small communities. What each did could affect only a few others, but conditions have now changed. Each of us can now, in countless ways, affect countless other people. We can have real, though small, effects on thousands or millions of people. When these effects are widely dispersed, they may be either trivial or imperceptible. It now makes a great difference whether we continue to believe that we cannot have greatly harmed or benefited others unless there are people with obvious grounds for resentment or gratitude. While we continue to believe this, even if we care about effects on others, we may fail to solve many serious prisoners' dilemmas and other paradoxes. For the sake of small benefits to ourselves or our families, each of us may deny others much greater total benefits or impose on others much greater total harm. We may think this permissible because the effects on each of the others will be trivial or imperceptible. 
if this is what we think, what we do will often be very much worse for all of us. If we cared sufficiently about effects on others and changed our moral view, we would solve such problems. It is not enough to ask, will my act harm other people? Even if the answer is no, my act may still be wrong and because of its effects. The effects that it will have when it is considered on its own may not be its only relevant effects. I should ask at the least, will my act be one of a set of acts that will together harm other people? The answer may be yes, and the harm to others may be great. If this is so, I may be acting very wrongly, like the harmless torturers. We must accept this view if our concern for others is to yield solutions to most of the many prisoners' dilemmas and paradoxes that we face. Most of the many cases where, if each of us, rather than none of us, does what will be better for himself, or for his family, or those he loves, this will be worse, and often much worse, for everyone 